Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, my colleague, Professor Sanja Gunadana. Uh, Professor Sanja graduated from the University of Moratua as a chemical engineer in 1993. Then she worked for a short stint as a temporary assistant lecturer at the University of Peradeniya before proceeding to UK for her PhD at the University of Birmingham. Upon return to the country in the year 2000, she joined the Department of Chemical and Process Engineering, University of Moratua, as a senior lecturer. She is a chartered engineer and a member of Institute of Sri Lanka since two, uh, year 2010. She was the head of the Department of Chemical and Process Engineering from April 2016 to March 2019. In addition, she has served the university and the faculty of engineering in numerous boards and committees, including University of Moratua Sports Advisory Board as the chairman from 2013 to 2017, a sports council of the University of Moratua as the senior treasurer from 2002 to 2011, faculty academic committee as a member during 2002 to 2016, Faculty Exhibition Committee, Orientation Committee, and University Industry Consultative Board, and uh, UOM Cargill's Food Process Development Incubator as an advisor. Further, she has served as a member of the National Committee of Biotechnology at National Science Foundation of Sri Lanka from 2006 to 2011, member in the Committee for the Preparation of the National Biotechnology Policy by the National Science Foundation, Sri Lanka, member in the committee for preparation of regulations of, on liquid biofuels of Sri Lanka uh, at Sustainable Energy Authority, technical advisory board member for practical action, national mirror committee member at Sri Lanka, Instru uh, Sri Lanka Standard Institute, ministry appointed subject expert to review new degree programs at non-state sector universities, and she was a consultant in biosystems engineering at Sri Lanka Technology Campus on contract basis during March to, uh, 2022, uh, February uh, 2022. Uh, Professor Santa has also contributed as a resource person in numerous workshops and training programs in Sri Lanka as a technical advisor for various local institutes. Professor Santa was a, a recipient of Endeavour Research Fellowship and spent her fellowship at University of Adelaide, Australia. Her research interests are in biofuels, biorefineries, biological waste treatment and food biotechnology. She has supervised a number of postgraduate research projects leading to PhD, MPhil and MSc degrees. Today, Professor Sanjay will deliver her lecture on biofuels challenges and practices in Sri Lanka. I believe that it's a timely important topic to this country and I'll invite Professor Sanja to deliver her lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Sham Tiger-Devay for the nice introduction. Very good afternoon, sirs and madams. Thank you so much, Professor Ajit Yalvis, Dean Faculty of Graduate Studies for giving this opportunity. I would like to dedicate my today's lecture to my beloved parents who are no more with us. As Professor Shanta correctly said, my today's topic is very timely. Uh, I selected this topic uh, from uh, various research areas that I work on because, mainly because uh, uh, very recently Sri Lanka uh, had a very uh, big world crisis and there were a lot of interest from various parties, um, individuals, industries, uh, various companies about, uh, about biofuels. So I thought, I, uh, without talking uh, about my other research areas, I must concentrate today on biofuels. First, we we'll look at what biofuel is. Uh, sometimes it is defined as any fuel that is derived from biomass. It can be plant, 
algae material or animal waste. Um, more frequently, it is defined as liquid fuel produced from renewable sources. It can be bioethanol or biodiesel. Uh, so everyone knows that biofuels uh, give good benefits uh, in terms of environmental uh, because it uh, has little net contribution to global warming and climate change. But, but there is an issue that is uh, the food versus fuel debate. That is because most of the raw material that are used to produce biofuels come from food sources. So uh, in early uh, 20th century, in the early stages of the, uh, the development of automobile industry, these two great gentlemen, Henry Ford and Rudolf Diesel, they identified biofuels as the future fuel. Henry Ford said bioethanol uh, bio, uh, can be the future which comes from foods. And uh, Rudolf Diesel said vegetable oils may become in the course of time as important as petrol. Now we have come to that era. After 100 years. Now we concentrate on plant-based uh, fuels. So I'll talk about the two fuels, biodiesel and bioethanol, uh, briefly. Uh, before I talk about what we have done in those two areas. So biodiesel, as the name implies, it is for diesel engines. It's an alternative fuel and produced from triglycerides. Triglycerides are subjected to transesterification with an alcohol and uh, in the presence of catalyst. Uh, this alcohol can be short chain alcohols like methanol and ethanol, and the catalyst, the preferably preferable catalyst is uh, uh, alkaline catalyst. After the reaction, a byproduct glycerin is produced, that needs to be separated before removing the traces of alcohol and catalyst from the biodiesel. So, washing step is required, and then after that, biodiesel is subject to drying to remove uh, any moisture present in it. So, this transesterification reduces the viscosity of oil and make it suitable for flow and combustion in uh, motor vehicles. The physical and chemical properties of biodiesel are specified by a standard ASTM D675103. Unreacted oil or raw oil or partially reacted oils cannot be considered as biodiesel. This uh, shows the reaction. Uh, in this transesterification reaction, the, uh, free, uh, the fatty acid chains attached to glycerin molecules are released and combined with the alcohol and produce the fatty acid methyl ester, which is known as barbitzer. And uh, the glycerin is uh, generated as a byproduct. So the, the feedstocks for biodiesel, the main feedstock is triglyceride that can be from vegetable oils, can be edible or non-edible. At the same time, can be waste cooking oil, animal fats, or even algae oil. So if we look at the world production of biodiesel, right? In 2019, 75% of biodiesel has been produced using vegetable oils. So those are mainly edible oils. 
if we consider the two giant producers, European region and United States, both use edible oil. Uh, in Europe, it's canola oil, and in US, it's soya bean oil. The properties uh, uh, of the produced oil depends on the uh, feedstock and its quality. So this fatty acid chain can be saturated, long chains, or it can be unsaturated, having uh, one or many double bonds. At the same time, that fatty acid can contain side chains, branches. So these uh, chains having branches or double bonds give various properties or it increases or decreases the important properties of uh, biodiesel. If you consider C chain number, for example, if, it, uh, if the fatty acid chain has, is long, then it is better. At the same time, if it does not have uh, branches or at the same time, if, if it is a uh, saturated oil, then the value of C, C10 value will be high. On the other hand, if we consider viscosity, if the uh, uh, chain is long, the viscosity will also be long, uh, will be high. Therefore, so we, uh, when we select the uh, oil for production of biodiesel, we have to consider all the qualities or properties of oil. So the uh, this is one instance where the quality of oil matters. In the transesterification reaction, if it is to go through the normal steps of transesterification and separation, washing, and drying, then the oil should not have more than 2.5% uh, of free fatty acids in it. If there are free fatty acids in the oil, what happens is uh, fatty acids react with the uh, alkaline catalyst and form soap, which is not favorable. Favorable at the same time, yield uh, uh, will be very low, and uh, separation of uh, product may not be possible. Therefore, uh, what we have to do is we have to remove that FFA in oil before we subject it to transesterification. Actually, we do not remove FFA from oil. We will first convert FFA into methyl esters, not using base catalyst, but here using an acid catalyst. After that step is done, we can subject the FFA reduced oil for transesterification. However, this reduction, if the FFA level is very high, FFA reduction may not happen in one cycle of esterification. Therefore, it has to be done several times depending on the level of initial FFA and the conversion. Once that is down to a value below 2.5, we can subject to transesterification. So this picture shows you a fresh sample of rubber seed oil. And when we try to subject it to transesterification without uh, treating FFA shown in the middle and the right, on the right, uh, the treated uh, rubber seed oil, uh, which can be nicely converted into biodiesel and uh, diesel. So if we look at this equation, esterification equation, uh, it happens between facilities and methanol in the ratio of one to one molar ratio. Uh, but the reaction is reversible. Therefore, we have to uh, have more reactors in order to push the forward reaction. Therefore, one mole of methanol may not be sufficient. Um, hence, researchers have uh, tried different ways of uh, 
quantifying the amount of methanol required in this reaction. And the other thing is we can determine the percentage of FFA in the oil, but determination of the moles of it is difficult because we don't know what uh, fatty acid chains are present in the oil. Therefore, uh, various ways have been uh, tested by various researchers. We also tested a, a different method and um, our method, I think it is very easy and uh, less time consuming and we published that uh, in a journal as well. At the same time, if we look at the uh, same equation again, right, as I said earlier, it is a reversible reaction and the water produced in the reaction um, gets, when it gets accumulated in the reactor, the backward reaction can also be happen uh, in this, uh, according to this equation. Therefore, what we did in our research is we remove after the uh, esterification reaction, we remove uh, the separated oil layer so that we do not allow the backward reaction to happen. And then we allow our reactant mixer, uh, mixture after removing water to settle. So when, when it settles or when you just leave it at room temperature even without agitation, right? Uh, FFA level drops. That is because the unreacted methanol in the system or partially reacted system continues the reaction. So both what we have done here are not available in literature. Therefore, we uh, file two patents based on our work here. Uh, very recently, one of the, the methods have been cassetted and the other one is under consideration. We also looked at various mixing um, in this reaction. Here we use ultrasonic mixing system and we found out that the reaction time can be reduced. At the same time, we can use a less amount of catalyst in the reaction if we use intense mixing. So here we have, uh, at the department, we have tried different oils in order to convert to uh, uh, biodiesel. Coconut oil is the only uh, first generation, that is food grade oil that we use. All the others are uh, 2D or second generation uh, feedstocks. Uh, having high content of free fatty acids. So we were able to successfully uh, uh, convert these oils having high FFA content into uh, using our methods into biodiesel. At our department, we carried out this work on lab scale, uh, on the bench, and then in five liter reactors and we scale it up to 50 liter. So this development work was done by a MSc research student. Uh, that reactor had three main units or compartments. One, uh, the main unit is the middle one, which is the reactor, which is used for both esterification and transesterification reactions. And the small react, uh, reactor on the uh, left is the methoxide react, uh, reactor where methanol and uh, sulfuric acid is um, mixed at the same time so methanol and uh, NaOH, the base catalyst is uh, mixed. The, the bigger reactor on the uh, right is the settling tank where settling or surface separation happens at the same time washing and uh, drying of uh, biodiesel happens. Uh, the, uh, 
the fabrication of uh, this reactor was done by uh, the kind of funds provided by Cargill's Ceylon Limited. For, for, for the biodiesel that we produce in our 50 liter reactor, uh, we uh, determined uh, or we calculated the cost involved considering uh, the oil at that time, oil cost considering base oil cost was only 20 uh, rupees. the cost of biodiesel and also consider uh, the market price. Actually, it's the normal market retail price of chemicals. And also, and also we uh, uh, determine the power requirement for uh, to run the reactor. So, uh, main purpose of fabrication of this reactor was to uh, support lo local uh, entrepreneurs who are interested in carrying out biodiesel work, right, but who do not want to spend on a reactor system. They can do their preliminary work, incubation work at our facility. Um, so we, uh, if someone comes with a sample of oil, we can easily determine the FFA level and the required uh, chemical quantities and the cost of production of uh, biodiesel from the uh, oil sample available. So we tested the fuel properties uh, the, of biodiesel that we produced and we communicated our research findings at various conferences uh, the list of papers are given there. And uh, the good thing is uh, our biodiesel that we produce uh, meet the quality standards specified by ASTM standard. We also tested our biodiesel in a uh, engine. It's a stationary en engine and uh, it is very much comparable with normal diesel. Then we used our uh, produced biodiesel in a three wheeler. Uh, we use two types of biodiesel that we produce. This biodiesel from neem oil and biodiesel from vegetable oils. In this uh, three wheeler, we use 100% biodiesel and uh, even though it is not uh, recommended, to use 100% biodiesel in unmodified engines. We use 100% biodiesel and um, the, the engine ran or the drive, be, the drive was very much smooth and uh, very much similar to normal petrol, uh, normal petroleum diesel. So if we look at the whole biodiesel production system, uh, so we start with vegetable oil, uh, acid esterification, trans esterification, and then separation of glycerin and refining. So we uh, carried out work in both these areas. And also we try to recover methanol because methanol is, uh, we use excess methanol in the reaction to drive the forward reaction. And therefore, uh, we should not waste our methanol, unreacted methanol from the reaction. So the methanol recovery was carried out and successfully used the recovered methanol in uh, subsequent uh, uh, biodiesel production trials. Then the glycerin refining is, was also carried out uh, because it is considered as a very valuable byproduct from biodiesel industry, which can be used uh, in food industries, pharmaceutical and cosmetic industries. Then we move into a different direction. Earlier we used homogeneous catalyst in both esterification and trans esterification. But, uh, but the issue here is we cannot recover the catalyst after the reaction. 
So that is waste and wash with the biodiesel generally. So we thought of um, moving into use of heterogeneous catalyst, that solid catalyst. So here you can easily uh, see very clearly that biodiesel, uh, glycerin and the solid catalyst are separated. So the separated solid catalyst can be reused. So it is uh, uh, in post life it is, it is beneficial. So uh, we used uh, by a commercially available solid catalyst as well as we try to develop our own catalyst using um, waste materials. So the materials uh, were subjected to various treatments to increase the acidity because here we concentrated mainly on uh, catalyst, acid catalyst that is for esterification reaction. So we subject um, uh, subjected our uh, waste material that is uh, waste tea uh, to uh, three different uh, treatments and uh, uh, and found out the sulfonation followed by carbon car um, uh, carbonization uh, was the best method to produce the cat catalyst for esterification. And here. Uh, then the uh, pat, uh, catalyst that we produced was used in the uh, reaction and uh, it gives more than 80% uh, conversion even after four cycles of use. Our next uh, step in this work is to uh, um, convert our powdered catalyst into a pellet form and used in the reactor, reactor that is shown on the right. So that uh, work is to be done. The reactor is already uh, fabricated. I was also involved in um, the work of practical action uh, as a member of the technical advisory board uh, of the biofuel committee um, and they were involved in a community-based biodiesel project and the three universities, University of Ruhuna, Peradeni and Morotua were involved in this project and uh, the uh, growing of Jatropha and the production of uh, biodiesel and the use of biodiesel were done in house uh, or at the same place in that village in Kvaratia. Uh, the planting material were provided to the villagers and they grew on, on their fences and then uh, the product, the, the yield was given to their community center and at the community center there was a trained person who expelled the uh, oil and produced uh, biodiesel in the reactor shown here. Uh, so it's uh, the reactor has the capability of producing five liters of oil and it was targeted to produce five liters per day. Uh, but, with, uh, but unfortunately that work or the project is not continuing anymore. Next I'll move into uh, bioethanol, which is the substitute for petrol. So some of the properties of ethanol is shown here. These properties give um, some uh, favorable uh, uh, conditions as a, a fuel as well as some unfavorable properties as a fuel. For example, if we take, um, so ethanol degrades some materials. Therefore, in using ethanol in the engine needs to be done carefully, right? So at the same time, ethanol forms easy trout uh, with water. Therefore, the uh, removal of water from the ethanol water mixture becomes difficult. So it's a good solvent. Uh, so other properties are also listed here. At the same time, it gives some beneficial properties, as I said before, uh, burn 
better and cleaner than fossil liquid fuel, produce less carbon dioxide and less particulate matter, and the most important thing is it gives high octane rating. Uh, but unfortunately, it gives lower calorific value. It is about two thirds of the normal uh, petrol. Uh, high heat of vaporization and colder flame temperature are about other fuel properties. If you look at this figure, uh, you can see the production of fuel ethanol uh, over the years from 1975. So the development of fuel ethanol started in early 1970s with the fuel, first fuel crisis. And it is expected to rise to a very uh, sharp rise uh, in um, the present time. Ethanol is used as a blend with petrol. Uh, so this in, uh, blending petrol with ethanol increases the octane rating and at the same time it adds oxygen to the fuel. So serves as an oxygenator but the thing is it can make, a uh, blend can be unstable and the blend becomes viscous, the fuel becomes viscous when blended with ethanol and uh, this blend uh, alters the volatility and distillation characteristics of uh, petrol. Then how much to blend? That depends on various factors. It can be the engine, it can be the compatibility of materials, or it can be the availability of fuel, or even purity of alcohol. Generally, in the world, uh, there, there are uh, various uh, 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 blends available in various countries like E5 where 5% ethanol and 95% petrol are mixed. Similarly, E10, E22 and even E85 are available in various countries. So a little bit about this uh, uh, solubility or uh, properties of these blades I'm going to discuss here. So here we have three components, ethanol uh, and uh, gasoline. Gasoline is not a pure component, but still here we have given as a one component. And there can be water in the system, especially in hydrous ethanol. Uh, when, when we distill ethanol, water, mixture, we have uh, we come across the azeotropic condition at 95.6 ethanol. Therefore, if you want to break or produce anhydrous ethanol, then we have to use other methods and not normal distillation, which cannot handle the azeotropic mixtures. So there can be small amounts of water, but if you make it anhydrous, your mixture will be on the uh, left side of the triangle uh, and E10 will be show, uh, is shown here at the same time E85 is shown but no water in it. But the problem arises if you try to blend hydrous ethanol. Hydrous ethanol, 100% hydrous ethanol is shown at the top here and if you try to mix that with petrol, uh, there can be various compositions. Depending on the proportion that you mix, it can fall into a two-phase region as well as one-phase region. So that is the issue with hydrous ethanol. Uh, the figure here shows you the phase separation that we did in order to explain this uh, uh, system one phase and two phase systems. Therefore, when we make our blends, we have to make sure that it, is, it will be in the one phase region. If not, if there's a phase separation, then the ethanol content in the fuel phase will drop. Then the octane value will not be the same that we expected. 
then the, uh, there's a potential for some drivability problems, especially if that water layer gets accumulated in the fuel tank, it can ultimately go to the engine and create problems. So what is the answer with this hydrous ethanol? Answer is flexible fuel vehicles. If you have blends up to E10, then you can use conventional vehicles, modern day vehicles, without any problems because the engines of these vehicles are capable of handling up to E10. But the blend has ethanol more than 10%, then we have to go for flexible fuel, uh, fuel vehicles or flexible fuel vehicles. Flexible fuel vehicles can even be used with 100% fibrous ethanol. So in these vehicles, ethanol compatible, compatible materials have been used. Uh, and these vehicles are in the market after 1980s, different models are available, flexible vehicles. Uh, so operate with equal efficiency on vector and ethanol. Flexible engine uh, and fuel systems are specially designed to accept petrol or alcohol combinations. So the Literature says Henry Ford designed his famed model T Ford to run on pure anhydrous ethanol as well as on gasoline. I don't know whether it is true uh, or false, but it is available in literature. Uh, so it would be uh, like if, if it is totally on anhydrous ethanol, uh, then it can be again a flexible vehicle. Sri Lanka also had a flexi fuel vehicle sometimes back. It is shown here with his owner, Mr. R. S. Sila Vikramanari. So, how bioethanol is produced? There are two platforms for production of bioethanol. One is sugar platform, where sugar, fermentable sugars, are used, are fermented can be molasses from uh, sugar industry or it can be starches like corn, like uh, US dust. They convert starch into sugars first using enzymes and then ferment them, ferment uh, sugars into ethanol. Or else we can convert lignocellulose cellulose material into sugars using enzymes and then into ethanol. The, the other platform is thermochemical platform where biomass is gasified and the gas is converted by fermentation or even uh, use uh, catalysts, chemical catalysts. So this figure shows uh, the same thing uh, in detail. Feed stocks can be sugar based or starch based. So these are basically food material uh, and therefore uh, they are considered as first generation feed stocks. So when you have sugar straight fermentation, then distillation and dehydration. If you have starch, it has to be subjected to hydrolysis first. That is to break the starch polymery chain into uh, glucose. Then that glucose can be converted by uh, to ethanol by fermentation. But when we consider lignocellulosic material, it is considered as a second generation material because generally they are not food material and it has to be, sorry, it has to be uh, separated into its basic components, cellulose, hence cellulose and lignin, because lignin cannot be converted, therefore it has to be removed. It can be used as a fuel. 
And cellulose and hemicellulose both contain sugars. But cellulose, sugars in cellulose are glucose, but uh, different orientation, therefore they are little different to starch, but enzymatically it can be broken down into glucose. Same as starch when you break it down. When it comes to cellulose, cellulose contains different sugars. It contains uh, pentoses and hexoses, both. C5 sugars and C6 uh, sugars. C5s are not that favorable under normal conditions because it can uh, produce various components which can be toxic in fermentation, especially to fermenting microorganisms. Um, the syngas fermentation is, as I explained earlier, uh, the uh, uh, synthesis gas from gasification reaction is uh, subjected to fermentation or catalytic conversion. Uh, so this area of work is under its uh, development stage. Therefore, it's long way to develop ethanol by thermochemical uh, platform. So if we consider our bio biomass, lignocellulosic um, feedstock, the first step is pretreatment. Pretreatment can be carried out by physical methods, chemical methods, or physicochemical methods. The main uh, purpose of pretreatment is to make, uh, to soften the material and release the three components, three main components, uh, cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, and make it available for the next step, that is hydrolysis. So depending on the pretreatment method that we use, the separation happens. This is uh, from one of our papers, this uh, figure. Uh, when you subject the lignocellulose material for acid pretreatment, uh, the liquid phase contains hemicellulose or part of lignin, and the solid phase contains cellulose and lignin. Whereas, if you subject it to alkaline free treatment, lignin and cellulose will be in one phase, and cellulose and part of hemicellulose will be in a different phase. So, therefore, we have to uh, select our free treatment methods accordingly so that we can easily separate the, uh, the unwanted and wanted components. The next step is hydrolysis. Hydrolysis can be carried out by uh, chemical methods or biological methods using acid, ionic liquids, or biological methods using enzymes. In this method, as I uh, explained earlier, uh, the cellulose will be broken down into C6 sugars, mainly uh, basically glucose using cellulase, uh, and hemicellulose hemi will be broken down into C5 sugars and C6 sugars using silanase. And the next step is the conversion of sugars into ethanol by fermentation. Here, microorganisms like yeast, bacteria, or even fungi uh, are used in this conversion. And uh, if we want to convert C5 sugars and uh, both C6 sugars, then we have to go for genetically modified strains. Uh, this hydrolysis and fermentation can be, uh, so if you look at the whole chain, uh, steps of converting uh, lignocellulosic material into bioethanol, uh, the pretreatment, hydrolysis, and then fermentation, and then distillation, a lot of steps are there, which adds to the cost of the product. So the researchers are working on uh, cutting down number of these steps, uh, but initially 
uh, if we look at the, uh, the basic method, it has pretreatment, then hydrolysis, where uh, both uh, C6 fermentation is done separately and C5 fermentation is done separately. So it is called sequential hydrolysis and fermentation. It, it is done uh, uh, separately. At the same time, you can carry out simultaneous saccharification and fermentation. So glucose produced by enzymatic hydrolysis is directly converted to ethanol in the same reactor here. So both um, yeast and cellulases are added to the same reactor for simultaneous saccharification. Then simultaneous saccharification and co-fermentation where uh, enzymatic hydrolysis and co-fermentation. The fermentation of C5 and C6 sugars are done in the same way. So yeah, it's a challenge, one organism for fermentation of all sugars. So met again, metabolic engineering comes into picture. Then we come to the most preferred or ideal condition that is consolidated bioprocessing where enzyme production, enzyme hydrolysis and co-fermentation of C5, C6 happens in the same reactor. This is the ideal method, but um, the is there can be a lot of research to be done in order to develop such enzyme uh, production in, uh, and hydrolysis fermentation capable of microorganisms. So uh, some people are working in this area. So if we consider the feedstock for bio, uh, bioethanol production, um, sugar cane or sugar cane molasses is the cheapest. Next is corn uh, and sorry, uh, the most expensive is sugar cane, next is corn, and least expensive is cellulosic biomass. If you consider the conversion cost, conversion of cellulosic biomass to bioethanol is very high compared to corn conversion or starch conversion, and uh, starch conversion is more expensive than molasses or sugar cane conversion. Um, over the years, researchers have worked in uh, development of enzymes for these uh, conversion processes and the cost of enzymes has reduced over the years and yield of uh, ethanol per unit mass of biomass has increased because of the developments. The figure on the right shows the change of feedstock cost conversion cost and the enzyme cost, uh, how it has happened over the years. So people are working in these areas, a lot of research is being done. Now commercial development of lignocellulosic uh, bioethanol is happening in the world. So this is the demonstration plan, first demonstration plan uh, set up in Spain. And then, uh, so it, it uses grain straw because uh, they produce a lot of grains and the waste, agricultural waste material is used in the production of ethanol in this plant. So this is the uh, first commercial like a cellulosic ethanol plant in US. There are a lot of uh, developments happening. Lignocellulosic uh, plants are coming up. A lot of uh, plants are in the farm pipeline and our neighboring country, India, is also developing their own lignocellulosic bioethanol plant. Uh, this figure also shows the development of lignocellulosic. The yellow uh, region shows the uh, cellulosic biofuels. So now in the world, like 
in 1921 and the predicted for 19, uh, sorry, 2021 and 2022. It follows similar amount of lignocellulosic ethanol is produced uh, as uh, corn ethanol. Uh, sugars can be, now what we discussed is sugars into bioethanol. Sugars can also be converted into directly into gasoline, diesel, or jet fuel light fuel, similar to that. But a lot of research in this area is required to develop a modified uh, strains yeast bacteria uh, for production of such fuels. Sugars can also be converted into various other chemicals by catalytic method, not by fermentation, not by biological methods, but by catalytic methods. Again, into uh, various um, fuel uh, components, which has properties like gasoline, diesel, or jet fuels, or even platform chemicals, which can be converted into fuels or various other important uh, commodities like solvents, um, pharmaceuticals, etc. So this is uh, such research work that we carried out at our department. Conversion of rice straw into 5 hydroxy methyl purpural, uh, commonly known as 5-HMF. So here we catalytically convert uh, glucose into 5-HMF. Uh, at the same time, we optimize uh, the separation of hemicellulose and lignin from rice straw. So in order, uh, in order to decide what methods to be used in our work, we uh, did a lot of literature search and we gave some average values for various methods in terms of time, energy, chemical cost, environmental impact, cellulose yield, and um, formation of 5-HF. We considered all these factors gave uh, average value for each component, considering its merits and demerits, and then we decided on the method to be used in our work. So we decided uh, dilute acid pretreatment as our method based on the literature. So our method had, has three steps. Uh, first thing is to uh, first by uh, to separate hemicellulose uh, using dilute uh, sulfuric acid pretreatment, and then to optimize the so, uh, separation of lignin using sodium hydroxide pretreatment and then to convert separated cellulose into 5-HMF. So some of the uh, pictures of our samples are shown here. Uh, we did not just separate the cellulose fraction because that is what we required. We tried to optimize the production of uh, hemicellulose from uh, from the residual or the from the filtrate, and then uh, we separated lignin from the filtrate. From the next step, that is from the next step, and then uh, we wanted to convert our separated uh, cellulose into 5 HMS then how or what to do. We considered all the different factors um, or input parameters in the conversion process and gave a weighted average or, weight, uh, or cost factor to each of these uh, inputs and came up with a, a cost function and uh, considered all the lit uh, available processes in literature and gave value to each of these uh, processes we subject it to this cost function and 
uh, uh, selected the process which gives the uh, lowest value or the minimum value. And that was selected as the method for production of 5-HMF in our work. So we carried out our reaction in this um, hydrothermal reactor and produced our 5-HMF, uh, which can be converted into a fuel. So we optimized our, uh, uh, all three steps using surface res uh, uh, response surface methodology and also uh, verified our optimal conditions obtained using practical uh, in experiments. Now the question is whether Sri Lanka produced biofuels. We produce bioethanol in all our sugar factories. So according to the published information, we produce around 24 million liters of ethanol. But none of that, or a drop of that goes to vehicles. Everything goes for the production of potable alcohol. That amount, 24 million liters, is not sufficient. We need 40 million liters per year to produce only potable alcohol. So we have to think from now whether to use that in the jar or whether in your cup. Because we saw uh, last month or a couple of weeks ago, people were very desperate. They were, they were ready to put anything in their uh, vehicles because they did not have fuel to, uh, to run their vehicles. People were inquiring and people were trying various, like uh, for diesel engines, people were using turpentine, thinner, and different other things. So to have enough ethanol, why not you put that into your vehicle? So we see in newspapers, in media that lot of big talks but never things in the ground on the ground so this gentleman mr ari silavi kramanayaka was very keen to give his product by ethanol from palavatta sugar when he was the chairman of palavatta sugar he was ready to provide that amount of ethanol that he produced um, as a motor fuel but it did not happen unfortunately uh, he got our support. This is one of our students, Dr. Himanta Kure, now working uh, in UK. He was with, uh, highly involved in this work. He produced Alcatrol, which is anhydrous uh, ethanol in the lab. And uh, we, uh, it was presented to the then president at the Antikirola in, in 2007. So in the newspaper, he has mentioned about our university as well. How about a biodiesel? Yes, we time, time to time we see a lot of news uh, about production of biodiesel. If, uh, and also uh, different uh, statesman, uh, statements given by the government and the officials or ministers, but nothing materialized. So according to this, uh, railway uh, engines to be run by, by uh, using biodiesel by 2010. Now we are in 2022, but still nothing has happened. We still depend on imported petrol and diesel. Not only that, the cultivation of biofuel, um, bio or jetrofar oil or jetrofar or oil generating plants. It's reported, websites, the companies came up with uh, uh, various uh, uh, websites like this and also the government. Uh, this is a government produced brochure but still we do not see any biodiesel in our country as a motor food. 
The, the biggest challenge is, according to my view, it is pain stop. Uh, uh, mainly for biodiesel, it is the pain the feedstock, meaning whether we have sustainable supply of feedstock. And whether we, uh, now the other issue is whether we have land to cultivate biofuel crops. Uh, because Sri Lanka is a small country with a high population, so we cannot allocate land for cultivation of dedicated bio crops. And the other challenges that I see is the support from the garden. As I showed you earlier, uh, we talk about it, but there are no regulations or policies in place. So the capital investment for production uh, or for development of biofuel industry is very really high. So that is also a question. The consumer acceptance, yes, that is another issue. Um, until recently, I don't think. Uh, people will go for this kind of thing. But now during this crisis situation, people were ready to uh, fill their vehicles with any type of food. So other thing is the technology, it is something that we can always adopt. So uh, feedstock, if we discuss a little further, biodiesel, food grade oils cannot be used in biodiesel production. So we cannot, consider our coconut or palm. Um, Non-edible oils are not available in sufficient quantities. Uh, and the other thing, uh, non-edible oils in Sri Lanka contain high content of FFA. That obviously that can be treated, but again, that's the cost involved. Chemicals used in production process are not locally produced. Then, Land issue for dedicated feedstock cultivation. If someone grows, we, can we assure that we take or we buy their produce? Uh, that is another uh, thing that we have to make sure. When it comes to bioethanol, we don't have sufficient sugar resources like molasses. Um, then the land issue, we don't have enough sugar cane cultivation in the country. At the same time, we cannot dedicate, uh, grow dedicated lignocellulose material for ethanol production. Then enzymes and again, chemicals are not locally produced. Enzyme production is a very uh, sophisticated industry and it is not done here. So what we can do in terms of bioethanol is to identify the most suitable lignocellulosic material. It can be agricultural waste. Then again, collection, storage, and transportation of such material. Now, in, we know we have seen in other countries there's a systematic way of collection of raw material or waste agricultural material from the fields like shown here. But we don't have such system. What we do is we allow it to, be, uh, be, uh, to decay or uh, uh, if it is a uh, very nuisance for the farmer, what they'll do is just burn it in the field. So just to highlight some of the support given by other countries, the, 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 the uh, main two producers of bioethanol, US and Brazil, right? Governments have supported them a lot. Therefore, in order to move forward, we have we, the government support is very much uh, required. So if you look at here, the tax incentives have been provided in US and uh, clean, according to their Clean Air Act, oxygen in the fuel is mandated uh, by the government and they have given a lower price for E10, E30, E10 uh, E85 as shown in this picture, uh, in the, uh, picture here. So the price of ethanol blends, petrol ethanol blends is lower than normal petrol, uh, petroleum fuel. 
then whether we have the support system obviously we have to have this kind of system if we go for uh, biofuel uh, I, I concentrate here only on bioethanol. Uh, the fi fi figure shows here. Uh, the blending should be done, carried out before or at the uh, petrol shed. So, are we ready for that kind of thing? Because um, storage, transportation should be done very carefully. Uh, ethanol is a hydroscopic. Um, component so it can absorb um, water right especially uh, from the tanks during transportation so we make sure that it does not get in contact with water then the separation as i explained earlier phase separation can happen so um, handling storing dispensing Procedures are specified in the handbook. Uh, so everything is available now in the world, but uh, we have to come up with a system if we are to go for biofuel uh, in the market. So the picture here shows uh, uh, the blending, how blending can be done. So you, you can have your unleaded gasoline separately in a tank and tank with then it shows E85 or even uh, ethanol. So when you want a certain uh, uh, mixture, E5 or E10, uh, at the dispenser, you, you can pump uh, the, the pump fill uh, mix or pump from the two tanks accordingly and provide uh, you with a certain uh, blend. So if we consider Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka produce only about 8% of our sugar required. The remaining 92% comes from overseas. So we import. According to the published information, we produce only 24 million liters of ethanol in a year. Petrol requirement is about 1,600 million liters per annum, considering 3,500 metric tons of petrol per day. That is our requirement, general requirement, 3,500 metric tons per day. So if we are to produce E5, then we need about 120 million liters of ethanol per annum. So in order to produce 120 million liters of uh, ethanol, we have to increase our sugar, sugar production by, by five times. So my question is whether this is possible. We, do we have land to produce this much of uh, sugar? Unless we go for good agriculture. That is, we have to increase our yield from a particular, uh, from a particular land or acreage and uh, increase uh, and go for high uh, good quality uh, agricultural material to get high yield of sugar, uh, sugar. otherwise the increase at this rate is it, uh, consider this eight percent into hundred percent or five increase by five percent we need large area of land of sugarcane cultivation. So what I propose here is we can go for lignocellulosic material and the raw material, then what? What is our raw material? So rice straw, if we consider rice straw, in three, uh, one kilogram of paddy, Produces about one to one point five kilograms of straw. So, if we consider our rice production five million five uh, million metric tons per annum, then we have five to seven point five millions of uh, million metric tons of rice straw. Rice straw contains about forty two percent cellulose. Therefore, if we can convert our cellulose 
from dry straw, right, we can hydrolyze and convert into bioethanol. Then how much can we produce? So this uh, diagram is from another literature. According to that research, one ton of rice straw can produce about 239 liters of ethanol. So they have shown two different methods, three treatment methods. Uh, so from two different treatments, they get different values. Those are not the uh, theoretical value. Theoretical value is very much higher than this. This is the practical, experimental value. So if we consider, uh, we can produce um, 240 liters per ton of rice straw. And if we convert 4 million metric tons of, uh, for example, taking 4 million metric tons of rice straw, then uh, we can produce 960 liter, 60 million liters, which is equivalent to 640 liters of petrol, considering the equivalent energy value. So at present now here, uh, the table here shows like if we use the, the gross rice straw as 2 million metric tons or 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever. So we can produce a large amount of um, petrol uh, to run our vehicles. So at uh, today, world market price of petrol is $1.47 per litre. So if we consider and develop our industry uh, in this, uh, this line, then we can save a lot of foreign exchange. When it comes to biodiesel, we, I do not see that much of potential with uh, the available um, raw materials. We have these uh, oils in small quantities, but what we can do is we can consider producing whatever the available, convert them into biodiesel and use as, a, as an oxygenator, as an additive with our normal uh, uh, diesel so that we can improve the quality of the fuel and also save a little bit of foreign exchange. So if we look at the world scenario, so I'm showing the same figure again. Uh, the biodiesel, development of biodiesel has not happened as with bioethanol in the world over the years. So it is more or less the same. It is again maybe due to the for, uh, issue with raw material. Um, we, we have these issues, but still in the world, other parts of the world, people are developing biodiesel production. Um, so this is the latest that I could find in the uh, web. So in, in very recently, uh, in the Europe, uh, in Europe, they have uh, developed a plant. They have constructed a plant to produce biodiesel, um, and that is happening with different uh, raw materials available in their countries. So the other thing that we can think of is the biorefinery. So we know. Crude oil is fractionated into various petroleum fractions and then can be processed to produce fuel, chemicals, and materials. In the same manner, biomass can be fractionated into various uh, components and processed into biofuels, biochemicals, and biomaterials. Similarly, uh, algal biomass can also be converted. So, in our case, in, in our uh, country, also, we can think of a similar thing, um, produce biofuels, at the same time concentrate on producing different other value-added products uh, simultaneously. So the research that I discussed earlier with rice straw that we carried out is also, was also carried out in this line. We did not just concentrate only on cellulose and conversion of that into 5-HMF, 
we considered uh, purifying, optimizing the, uh, the separation of cellulose and um, hemicellulose and lignin as well. Uh, so this is some of my involvements um, with various uh, institutes uh, in the area of biofuels. Uh, I was a member of the Technical Advisory Board on Biofuels and Practical Actions and a Miller Committee member on Sustainability Criteria for Bioenergy and represented a couple of meetings. Um, ISO meetings held in different parts of the world. Mem I was a member uh, who developed regulations on biofuels for Sri Lanka um, and also have consented to work with Sri Lanka Institute of Biotechnology in their biofuels and biorefinery group. Uh, and I have done various presentations uh, based on uh, the research that we have carried out at uh, Morotour. And also, I have helped uh, given uh, technical know-how to various in, uh, in, uh, interested parties like hotel chains, food restaurants, processing industries to develop uh, or when they come with uh, inquiries. So as I mentioned earlier, so uh, the, my involvement with the National Mineral Committee, headed by Dr. Sugata Pala, who was the uh, Director General of Sri Lanka Sustainable Energy at that time. And uh, Professor Ajit was also a member of the committee. And uh, that gave us a lot of, um, and the involvement and the participation in these meetings gave us as to how what uh, this biofuel uh, bioenergy industry happens in the rest, uh, other parts of the world. Just uh, to, before I finish off, I want to highlight again the government policies uh, favor especially here I concentrate on bioethanol because uh, I might uh, discuss about biodiesel issues, uh, therefore we cannot go for national level bio, uh, biodiesel production, but individuals uh, in small scale that can I would also like to thank my family, um, my teachers who taught me from my kindergarten up to university, uh, and my friends and relations who supported me throughout my journey. Um, and thank you so much for your kind support and encouragement. Extremely sorry about the Thank you, dear madam, from the Tanja Bunavardhan, for educating us on the challenges and the prospects for biofuels in Sri Lanka. Also, dear madam, congratulations on achieving this milestone. Now, I would like to invite the dear Minister of Foreign Work, Professor Nali Nikramarachi, to hand over the token of appreciation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Sanjay Maharaja, for that very comprehensive uh, presentation on biofuels and biodiesel and also um, capacity of Sri Lanka to produce biodiesel or biofuels. I hope one day that uh, Sri Lanka becomes a uh, producer of biofuels and you can become the final. Thank you very much. Please thank have you. a problem of presentation. Thank you, dear sir. It is now time to conclude today's proceedings. Thank you, everyone, for joining with us. Until next time, thank you. <laughs>